Hey everyone, if you are watching this video during its premiere, welcome to Cozy. If you are watching this after August 21st, Cozy was a four day online costume symposium. Basically a whole bunch of us costumers got together and decided that we were gonna do a big thing. So we had tons and tons of videos on a whole bunch of different topics as well as big group collabs and live panels. And if you want to check some of that stuff out, because there was some really amazing content put out during Cozy, I will put the links below to the official playlists as well as a couple others. And I hope you check some of that other stuff out and enjoy it. But let's get into what this video is actually about. I want to talk about brocade tablet weaving. Uh, <clears throat> which I'll be honest is my favorite kind of tablet weaving I like it better than other kinds tablet weaving in general is a warp face weaving method which means that the long threads that run the full length of the piece are what show and that the weft threads which are what hold it together and you know go weft to right um, they are not visible at all except on the selvage edges where they make the turn as they go between the rows of weaving. Brocade weaving adds a second supplemental weft that floats over the top of the warp thread so that it is visible and it can create patterns and designs and it can get really fancy or just very basic geometric shapes. There's so much that can be done with this. Fragments have been found all over um, from all different time periods. This as a technique has a very long history and was used for a very long time. And you know, people are still doing it today, obviously. <laughs> Perhaps the most famous finds are the ones from Burka. Um, Burka is, was a settlement in Sweden and in the late 19th century they did a whole bunch of excavations, primarily of graves. and during those excavations they found I believe hundreds of fragments of brocaded tablet woven bands all dating to the 10th century thereabout. A PDF is available um, detailing all of the finds made actually several PDFs are available detailing all of the finds that were made during these excavations all of the textiles are specifically in the third volume of these this set of books and you can actually find the PDFs for this either through the museum itself that that holds the pieces or also on archive.org and I will link them both both of those down below as well the books are uh, the text is in Swedish but the images are clear enough that it's really easy to take them and follow them Perhaps not directly, but a I know a lot of people have recharted them, including myself. So this is actually one of the charts I made based off of the Burka band. And I've got, this one is on a full grid while this one is not. Let's see. <clears throat> and for this chart, specifically how this works is the yellow would be my brocade thread, my my either a metallic thread or something else depending on what I decided to do where and the blue is my ground thread I like using colors because it just further distinguishes it for me and then also while I'm charting it up I can kind of visualize and play around like if I want to make this out of this color background and this color thread I can I can kind of pre-visualize my future weaving but I'm gonna get and I, I will also I will talk more about how to actually read the charts in a little bit but I want to talk about a couple more books that I highly recommend if you really want to get further into brocade tablet weaving. And the first of those two books is Anna Nooper's model book. Um, Anna Nooper was a German nun. She was about 70 years old in uh, 1517 when she sat down and wrote a book full of brocade patterns for tablet weaving. And this book has been translated, transcribed, whatever terminology you want to use. And these patterns, which were originally just letter based as to whether, you know, you pass over or under, um, they, were they were translated and charted by Nancy Spies. 
and have been republished since. And this this book is fantastic. It's got 45 patterns plus variations on most of these patterns. Um, this this is the charting. Make sure I'm up. I'm going the right way. This is what the charts look like from that book. So that is an amazing source if you really want to get into some, if if you're in the SCA for example, some late period um, brocade weaving. As I said, the book, the original dates to 1517. The other book I really want to talk about, which is the best book ever, if you want to get really into tablet weaving with brocading is Ecclesiastical Pomp and Aristocratic Circumstance. <laughs> it's a bit of a tongue twister. Um, this is also by Nancy Spies and there is just so much information in this book. It's got information about different finds, where things came from, when they came from, as well as like analyses and, and scientific work done on these to study fiber content, the the spin of the thread, what the metallic thread was, how it was made. There's just so much information and it also includes some charts from bands dating from the 6th to the 16th century. So it covers a, a broad uh, range of different styles and okay for the most part it's all the same technique, which actually makes it easier, but different styles and, and how trends worked um, and, and also what types of applications these bands had. So that book, just amazing. Now, unfortunately, both Ecclesiastical Pomp and Anna Newper's model book are out of print. And if you can find a hard copy of these books for under I'll be honest, like a hundred dollars each. That's kind of a steal because <laughs> they're really hard to find. But <laughs> I've got your back. The publisher sells PDFs directly of both of these books, which is great if your budget doesn't allow for spending. I think the last time I looked, when I <laughs> when I looked a couple days ago on Amazon, um, Anna Newper's model book, the only copy for sale was almost seven hundred dollars, and yeah, that's that's a lot for a book. <laughs> so anyway, both of these books are available f direct from the publisher as PDFs, which I will also link below. Um, at the time of filming this video, Ecclesiastical Pomp was for for sale for twelve dollars and Anna Newber's model book was five dollars so you know seventeen dollars versus hundreds over a thousand for both on the second hand market totally worth it all right um, one last note before I turn my camera around and I start talking about some weaving this is not a tablet weaving 101 video I'm not going to go into depth about all of the basics for how to get started um, you know, picking a loom, arranging your cards, warping the loom, all that. I'm not going to cover that in this video because I don't want it to get super long. But I will link up some people who have some fantastic tutorials. Um, there are some other creators who also do all kinds of brocade, or not brocade weaving, other kinds of tablet weaving that have, that have well covered the basics. So... I'll recommend those and link those down below as well. There are going to be so many links in my description. And I'm going to start showing you guys how to specifically do some brocading. <laughs> let's go. Alright, so let's get in close with some bands and then we're going to get into weaving. So, I'm going to show you two. This is actually the first one I ever wove. <laughs> it's got a couple mistakes in it, mainly on the back side. But we're not going to focus on those. It's also been a while since I last used it. And as you can see, it wants to twist on its own. That just means I need to block it again, which I can do with steam. Um, the same way I would block something that I knitted or crocheted. This is made with silk thread um, for both the warp and the brocading weft. So I used no metallic thread for this, just, just the silk. As I said, this was a practice piece. So I didn't want to get into the more complicated metallic thread for my very first try. 
This is also the most common method for brocading that you see in extant period pieces and fragments that are still around and it is what is called the running stitch style of brocading. So you can see I've got that little dotted line of the yellow brocade threads running along the back on either side except for where I made mistakes as I mentioned. <laughs> And that is so that the edge of my brocading thread does not go all the way to the edge, the selvage edge of my band. And that is the most common style found in surviving pieces. I've also got this band, which is silk and metal, and then it's, it's then mounted further onto a linen band. I made this one over late winter, early spring this year, and it is perhaps my favorite weaving piece. Um, this one is not super high contrast between my metallic thread and my ground thread, as you can see, so it's easier to see the design on an angle rather than straight on, but it is so sparkly. <laughs> this one I wove slightly differently. I did bring my my brocade weft all the way to the edge and I did not hide it. This, there is only, I believe, one extant piece that has this method with the edge visible like this, so it, it was, as far as we can tell, not a common one. I opted to do it for this because I, I knew from the beginning I was going to be mounting this, and I just wanted to add that little extra detail on the edge, but it's not, as I said, not as common in original pieces. And this piece is actually from one of the burka bands. I charted it myself and then I wove it up. Talk supplies as well. You're going to need your ground thread. I generally use silk as I mentioned. This is a plied silk. It's, it's on the heavier side. I'd say it's about equivalent to a size 10 crochet cotton. And then I've also got, this is a reeled mulberry silk. It's not plied. It is, it is a single ply silk thread and it is much finer. This is what I wove this band out of. It is the same silk as this. So, like always, the size of your thread will affect the size of your weaving. So, thread for your warp. Either the same thread or a matching I, I tend to use a finer thread for my weft, my main weft, but that's a personal choice. You can use the same exact thread. If you use a finer thread for your weft, you'll be able to pack your weaving tighter. So that's part of why I do it. You will need a your supplementary weft, which is what we'll show. Mostly I tend to use for metallic threads. Um, a, this is a six strand divisible Embroidery thread, I generally use either one or two strands when I am brocading. This one, as you can see, is still, still in its package. Otherwise, if I want a decorative thread, I will use just the same type of silk as whatever my warp thread is in a contrasting color. This is some yellow that I used for a different project a while ago. I prefer, I will put, while I will put my regular standard weft thread on a, a shuttle like this, um, I have a whole bunch in a bunch of different styles, but I, I generally use like just some type of wooden shuttle for my main weft thread, but I will load my, my supplementary weft, my brocading weft. I prefer tatting shuttles, um, they're nice because they hold the thread and if you drop it they don't un <laughs> unreal so here's another one so that's all of my thread and of course cards I need some type of card they can very easily be made these are some old ones of mine that I made from let's see, this is vanilla almond cereal and I don't remember this one what this one was Anyway, so these, these are just cut out of cereal boxes. I, you know, cut squares. And then for these, I just 
rounded the corners by hand with scissors so they're not perfectly even or symmetrical and they, they these are labeled more often than not I will use one of my favorite materials for cards is this which is um, six mil stencil plastic so it's it is soft and flexible so if you're doing like heavyweight weaving I would not recommend this but it works nicely for the light lightweight threads I use otherwise I also have taken my old business cards these <laughs> if you can see that white line that's going on over here um, these were misprinted so I had a ton of these that I didn't want to hand out so I just turned them into weaving cards I will actually I will be doing a video in September where I actually go through the process for making cards so I will go more in depth on how to make your own weaving cards next month in a separate video I promise <laughs> so those are supplies and then your last the last thing you need will just be something to secure your threads whether it is a loom of some sort or if you prefer backstrap I, the first time I tried tablet weaving I actually used my bed posts so you can there are a lot of different ways you can warp up and hold your threads I have two types of looms this is my the smaller of my two looms which is an inkle loom and I have a project started on here but this is not what I'm gonna So, yeah. so this, this is this is the smaller of my two ankle looms. I have one that's larger, but I, I'm not going to be showing it on camera because it is very large. Okay. So as I said, this this is my small ankle loom. This gets me about 45 inches of woven, of of weavable length, I should say. So this is great for for making headbands for me. So this is this is my primary loom. I use this one most often when I'm weaving. But I also have a cradle loom. I need to zoom out a little further because this one is around the other way. This one is a lot bigger, as you can see. And it is called a cradle loom because it's got, uh, it kind of looks like a cradle. <laughs> this this one is an open-sided one. There are some that have closed sides, so it, it looks a little bit more like a cradle. Um, but basically, my I have two different band wheels, uh, ratcheting wheels on both sides, and then I can move my project forward and back as I need to. So that is what I'm going to be working on today. But we still got a little bit more to talk about before we really get into the actual weaving. So this is the pattern I am showing you right now. It is, here is the chart for the pattern. This one is from Anna Newper's model book. It is pattern, I believe it's pattern 49. This, as I mentioned a little while ago, this book contains patterns and variations. So this is a 25 card wide pattern while well as this is a 23. And I am working on the 23 card pattern. So I'm working on the slightly narrower one. And I've already done one repeat of my pattern here. So we're going to take a nice close look at that. And we're just going to go over the anatomy of my weaving. And then I'm going to show you how I do it. So as I mentioned, this is the running stitch style so I'm not bringing my brocade thread all the way to the edge it is getting looped under and if it doesn't make sense as I'm talking about it it'll make sense when I'm actually showing it I promise the way that brocading works is I've got as I said my supplemental metallic weft here and this goes over top of my other my warp threads which is my blue that you can see some there there's a variety of ways to weave the ground I personally prefer the look of all of my cards going in the same direction and always turning in the same direction so all of my cards at the moment are 
I, I don't want to say there is a or s because different people use different terms but I am coming from the back in through the right and out through the left as you can see I don't have letters on my cards for brocading because I'm not doing a certain number of turns in one direction a certain number of turns so I, I don't have my cards labeled because I just turn all of my cards the same way every single turn and I use my little loop to keep my cards in order when I'm not leaving so I don't have to worry about them turning on their own when I'm not working so let's go back a little bit so I've got my visible wefts here and then the places where they go under threads under the warp threads in the pattern those are called tie downs I am doing two thread tie downs which means I am going under two threads for each card when I need to go underneath the pattern it makes more of my warp thread visible in the pattern and gives me bolder lines if I wanted finer lines I could go under just a single thread out of the four from each card but generally this is my preferred look and it gives a fairly stable band once it's finally woven and actually I have to loosen it so, as I mentioned this is the running stitch style so you can see the little dots of my this is focusing there you go you can just see the little dots from my silver thread where it runs along the back side one stitch one card in from the edge all right so all of that said let's get to actually let's let's actually do some weaving now all right as you can see i have a slightly slightly finer thread well on my shuttle here that is my main weft and before I continue before I turn my cards and continue weaving I'm going to bring in my silver weft so again this is a personal preference for myself so your you might try this out and find you don't like how it works but what I prefer to do is I like having my shuttles be on opposite sides of my weaving so that if my main weft shuttle is going this way through my main shed which is this opening here then I want my supplementary weft to be going that way so what I'm going to do is before I actually start weaving visible visibly with it I'm gonna go nah, I'm just eyeballing this a few cards in from one side then I'm gonna go through the f almost the full we weft Oops. let me see if I can do that again without dropping so I'm just going through at random here I don't know why I cannot keep a hold of this today and then I am going to I'm going to pull my last card away from the pack and these two threads here I'm gonna go and drop my thread my, my shuttle in between those cards I'm leaving myself a bit of a tail here I'm leaving myself a bit of a tail over here this will get cut off when I'm done but first I want to secure this inside my band before I start doing any visible weaving with it so I've got this going that way and I've got this going that way so I'm going to do a single turn of my cards and as I said I always turn the same way I prefer to turn up and away from myself so I'm just going to turn 
up and away. I generally open up my shed with my fingers first. And then I take something to beat, beat it down with. I don't need to pull on my my metallic thread yet, but I am going to pull this in, just give it another tap. Right. I always make sure that I throw my main weft through the shed first, the full shed first, and then I'm going to do my supplementary weft, my, my decorative weft. So I don't want to bring it around my edge because I don't want it to show up my salvage. So what I'm going to do is again, I'm going to pull that first card away and come up of my between the two cards for my bottom thread. I'm going to leave a little loop here. I'm going to throw through the entire shed. Then I'm going to do the same thing on the other side. I'm going to pull my outside card out and then drop my shuttle between the first and second cards, the bottom threads over here again. Pull my threads down and do another turn. I always, either with my fingers or, for example, a, a nice knitting needle, I hold on to my decorative warp as I pull it in. And then once that's, as you can see, I've got it tight against, I then pull it that little extra bit so it's flush against the back of my weaving. And I do that mainly so that it doesn't twist around itself as I pull and then I don't get a little, it's, it's not a knot, it's just a little extra bubble of thread. And then I'm going to do the same thing with my main weft. And just give it one last tap. And now that I've done two passes in each direction with my thread, I'm going to start doing the actual brocading now. So, as I said before, I always, always main weft first. Because what's happening as I will start to weave is this is going to be catching around this. My, my metallic thread is going to be catching around my main weft as it passes between the cards. So I always it, I absolutely need to make sure every single time that I do this in the correct order or my metallic thread will not have something to catch through and then I will have a little floating loop going on here, which I definitely don't want. So that's why always the main thread, the main weft through the full shed first. So I've done my main thread through my full shed. Now I'm going to open up a secondary shed and that is where my metallic thread is going to pass through to create the visible pattern on top of my warp. All right, so here is the pattern that I am currently weaving and I am going to start with this row right here, the one that is right above my, it's my black line here because this is the start of one repeat. So basically what I do is I work from left to right when reading the lines on my chart. You can work from right to left if that makes more sense to you. You just always want to make sure that you are consistent, always starting your chart and counting your cards from the same side. For this specific pattern, it's not a big deal because it is symmetrical from side to side. But for example, for this pattern, oops, which I can hold on to, I swear, 
This one is not symmetrical, so if you kind of skip back and forth, you'll you'll end up with something funky going on. All right, so basically all I'm going to do is I'm going to count my cards. For every empty box or, or white box in this chart, that is a spot where my warp threads show. So that is a spot where I'm going to be passing my metallic thread underneath the warp. And then anywhere there's a black dot, that's where my warp, my weft thread, my silver thread is going to be on top. So basically I'm just going to be doing under, over, 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 under, over, under, over, 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 etc. So I do that by just counting my cards. As I said, I count from left to right. So let's do that. As I said before, the one thing I always do, my first move every single time is always taking my main weft thread and throwing it through my main shed. So I'm going to do that. And then I'm going to start working my silver thread. And as I said, I'm going to be working it in the opposite direction because that's my preference for how I weave. So first I'm going to bring it up between one card in through the bottom threads and then I am going to start counting my pack of cards so I want to go under this first card so I'm going to put my beater under the first then I've got four to go over so I'm going to count four over one under one over one under and then three over one under and that is my middle card right there so I am just going to reverse what I did so I'm going to go over three under one over one under one over four and then under the last one and where you can see my beater through that is where you're going to be able to see my silver threads once I throw that. So this is my secondary shed and this, what I'm calling my beater, it's actually um, a bone turner or a bone folder, which is something that bookmakers tend to use, but I find it works really well for this. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to stand it up and I have opened up a secondary shed in my weaving. So take a quick second turn this on its side so this is the secondary shed I just opened this right here if I turn it flat again here you can see this here this is my main shed this this opening this opening here that is where my main weft goes through every single time and then I've got my secondary shed this is where I'm going to throw my secondary warp or my secondary weft and have my metallic thread going through. So here it goes through my secondary shed. Then I am going to drop it between the last cards. And I'm going to make sure these are all the way down as close to my previous row as possible before I turn my cards just to make it easier when I'm beating it and then I'm going to turn my cards I've got a wandering thread <laughs> going to push those down. Now let's zoom in. As you can see my metallic thread here is twisted so I want to make sure I untwist and open up this loop here. 
before I pull that thread through. And I'm pulling this first. You see where this little tiny loop left, and I'm going to just pull that in flush. And then I'm going to pull my warp. Sorry, my main weft. <laughs> and then that is my first row of brocade. I need to give it one last tap down. And then I'm going to start the process all over. Uh, my camera is not behaving. Alright, so like I said, main weft first. I'm going to double check my pattern. And now, even though my thread is on this side, I'm still going to start counting from the left. But I am going to just pop my thread through there first so I don't have to remember it. So, under one, three, one, one, one. Three, one, 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 three, one. As you as you work, you, you tend to, especially something like this, which is predictable, you tend to remember what, what your pattern is as you go along. So here I am, putting my metallic thread through my secondary warp web. Of the, my secondary shed. I'm going to drop that again. Then I'm going to go in between those two cards, those two threads here. Bring my threads as far down as I can get. And then I'm going to turn my cards. try and get that down as close as I can here. Untwist my loop. is pretty much it. You just keep repeating that over and over again following your pattern.
All right, so you've reached the end of your brocade pattern and you're done with that and you want to finish it off. Basically, it's just the same as how we started except in reverse. So I'm going to once again throw my weft through my shed. I'm going to bring my brocade thread up through here again. And then I'm just going to toss it through the main shed and back down between the outer card and one in. Turn. going to do that once more. Between my inner mo outermost and the next card, through the shed, and then back down between the outermost and next card. Turn. Start going up inside the outermost card. I am not going to go all the way through my shed this time though. I am going to go only about two thirds of the way across the shed and then down and out through the bottom. Turn. And then depending on what type of band it was, I would just keep going for however long I wanted to continue weaving plain. For now, I am just going to go a couple more turns. I am going to take this off the loom right now and just show you the last couple of steps for finishing this. If I can get my knot untied. <laughs> So here is the front of my weaving and the back.
You may or may not have a preferred method for dealing with your weft ends for the rest of your thread, whether you just leave it hanging as a fringe or if you somehow knot it, braid it, whatever. Generally for this end what I will do is I will thread it into a blunt needle and then just work it back and forth a couple rows inside what I've already woven. That's my preferred finishing method for my weft tail. Now for my brocade thread, because I wove it past where I finished brocading, here all I need to do is just snip it as close as possible, preferably without snipping <laughs> your ground thread. Pro tip, don't use giant ginger shears to do this. I don't know where my little scissors are, so I'm slight, at a slight disadvantage at the moment. But yeah, this, these threads I just cut as close as I can to here and then it becomes a finished band. As you can see when I initially started I worked this back in so that I can just cut this off here. But that is basically how you do brocade weaving. I really hope you guys enjoyed this video. I hope it inspires you to give it a try. Uh, if you enjoyed it, please subscribe. I will be doing more all kinds of content. I will be doing a video on how to make the weaving cards soon. And by soon I mean, where's my calendar? Two weeks? I believe it's two weeks. The first Wednesday in September I will be putting that video out. And yeah. I hope to see you again around here. If you give this a try, um, take photos and send me on Instagram. You can find me there at miss.philomena. And yeah, like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And I hope to see you again in the future. Bye.